Thank you for watching The Word and Sword. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. We invite you to call in during this program to ask your Bible questions. In this episode of The Word and Sword, we will examine four lessons from the Bible. Our first study focuses on the temptation of Christ. Satan tempted Jesus to violate God's will, but the Lord resisted. In so doing, he set the example for us and showed us that it is possible to overcome Satan even in the most severe circumstances. This study will build your faith and determination to defeat the devil. Next, we will examine the Bible doctrine of the Godhead. This is a doctrine that confuses some people because of the lack of clear teaching being done. Our study will lay out the simple, straightforward teaching found in God's Word and clarify the nature of deity. Our third lesson looks at Noah. Specifically, we study his salvation. He was saved by grace, by faith, and by water. The Bible teaches we are saved just like him. No, we do not need to build a giant boat to survive God's judgment, but we are saved by grace, by faith, and by water. Don't let that confuse you, but join this study to see what the Bible says. Finally, we will study a lesson to help us purpose in our heart to be faithful to God. The focus is on the prophet Daniel. He was determined to serve God, even while living as a captive in a foreign land. His faith is inspiring and will motivate you to a greater commitment to the Lord. Again, thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. We encourage you to call 828-465-3009 and ask your Bible questions. Call during the program to connect live with one of our members or call anytime, leave a message, and we will get back to you. You may also leave a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword, or send us an email at contact at wordandsword.com. Right now, we invite you to grab your Bible to study with us and call 828-465-3009 with your Bible questions. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about the temptation of Jesus Christ. We want to study that in this lesson and draw some lessons out for us, some points of application for you and I. So let's begin by reading Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and... In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, in him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Of course, we see here how Satan is trying to get Jesus to commit sin. He's offering him certain allurements that were appealing to Jesus, but if Jesus took them, if he seized on to them, he would have violated the will of God and thereby transgressed what was right and disqualify himself from being the savior of mankind. And that really is the aim of the devil here, that he's tempting Jesus of Nazareth, but he also recognizes that Jesus is the son of God and the savior of the world. But if he can get him to sin, then he will destroy God's plan for saving man. And so this is 
an important account written in the Bible to show us how Jesus dealt with the temptation. Now, something that might kind of trip us up a little bit is the idea that Jesus, who was God in the flesh, could be tempted. But let's notice in John 1, verses 1, and then down in verse 14, that Jesus was deity, but he was deity in the flesh. So he was subject to temptation. So John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's referring to Jesus or the second person in the Godhead, the Son of God, that he was with God, and he was God, that is, he was divine. Now, down in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So while Jesus was here on earth in the flesh, he was subject to the things that you and I are subject to. For instance, he was hungry and thirsty. That's part of what happened with him in the wilderness, that after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And so there was an opportunity for temptation there. So he physically desired food and needed food to survive here. But then also he became weary. He became tired at times. His body was subject to physical limitations, unless, of course, there was some type of miracle that was performed, like when he walked on water. If that wasn't a miracle, or if he didn't perform a miracle at that time, he would have sunk in the water just as you and I would sink in the water. But be that as it may, he was hungry and thirsty. He grew tired. He had rest or needed rest. He needed sleep at times. But also, we understand then, as he was here walking among men in the flesh, he was subject to temptation. And that record for us, at least the record of his temptation by Satan there, is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 4. And we see again how he dealt with that temptation. And because we have that record of his temptation, we have an example that we can be inspired by, that we can be encouraged by, and that helps us. Remember in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, the Hebrew writer says this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all these things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted." So Jesus came and lived in the flesh so that we can relate to him. Let's understand this is not saying that Jesus needed to learn what it was like to be a man, that he needed to learn what it was like to be tempted, if you will, to face the trials and the challenges that man faces. Because after all, Jesus being God, he's creator. He's the one who created man. In John 1 verse 3, it says he created all things and without him, nothing was made that was made. So Jesus really didn't need to learn about us, but we needed to learn and we needed to understand he knows what it's like for us to go through this. And so that gives us aid, that gives us comfort, that gives us encouragement. And in seeing his example on earth and seeing his example in this temptation, he helps us in our submission to God. He helps us in our conviction of the truth. He helps us in our resistance to Satan as Satan would try to destroy you and me. So let's look a little bit deeper here and draw some lessons out of what's happening in Matthew chapter 4 as we see Jesus being tempted. First of all, let's understand we need to expect temptation. 
We need to realize we will be tempted in this life. Jesus was tempted, and so we will be tempted. He was tempted, let's understand now, he was tempted to commit sin. That was the whole point and purpose here. And the devil will tempt us to commit sin. He'll tempt us to do something that would sever our relationship with God in heaven. Adam and Eve were tempted. You remember them in the garden, how that they were there in the garden. God had given them a command that they may eat of every tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan came along in the form of a serpent and tempted Eve, and she reached out and took that fruit and ate it, and Adam then ate it as well. Now, let's understand that Adam and Eve and Jesus were tempted to commit sin, but they were not ones who had depraved nature. You see, there are people today who say that man has a depraved nature, that man has a nature that is wholly inclined to commit sin, and he can't help but to commit sin. That is utterly false. They say the idea that we sin is because of that depraved nature. Well, Jesus did not have a depraved nature, yet he was tempted to commit sin. Adam and Eve were not created with a depraved nature, and they were tempted to commit sin. And the same is true for us today. We do not come into this world with a depraved nature. We do not come into this world born as little babies, wholly inclined to sin and to violate the will of God. We are not born into this world with an inclination toward evil. We grow up, we learn, and we make a choice, just like Adam and Eve made a choice. Jesus made a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. Jesus made the right choice. And of course, we need to be more like our Lord. We are in this world and we will not escape it. We will face the pressures of the world around us and we will face temptation. Jesus had prayed this for his disciples in John 17, verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So there's no escaping temptation as long as we are living in this world. We're going to face it. We're going to face the evil one. But what Jesus is praying there is that they would overcome him and we need to overcome the evil one just as our Lord and Savior did. Now, we will be tempted when We are at times of great victory when things are going well in our life, when we are exalted, if you will. And we will be tempted when things aren't going well, when things are difficult and bad in life, when we are downtrodden. So two examples of that, of course, Jesus, first of all, things were going well in his life. We read the temptation in Matthew chapter 4. If you back up to Matthew chapter 3 and read what happened just prior to him going into the wilderness and being tempted, it says in John 3 verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus was tempted right after his baptism by John and this great display of God's approval, the spirit descending like a dove, the voice of the father coming from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We need to understand the devil will try to get us at a time maybe when we are not paying attention, when we have let our guard down, when everything is going well and we're relaxed, if you will, that he will come after us. Maybe this is after we first became a Christian and we feel good. We are elated 
because we have been redeemed by the Lord. And then here comes the devil with a sneaky attack to try to destroy us. Maybe when we've left a sin in our life, we've repented of that and put it out of our life. Well, the devil's going to use that occasion to try to blindside us. And then again, he will use that maybe when we have a great life event like marriage or we have a child and we're very happy. We're very pleased and our attention is there on that great event in our life. Or maybe it is when we get a raise or we get a promotion at work. We think, well, everything is going well. But then here comes the devil to try to get us, to try to destroy us. He'll try to destroy us when we're downtrodden, when we're having a hard time. A good example of this is Job. You remember in the beginning of Job that Job was a righteous man and the devil asked God for permission to go after Job, to attack him, to try to get him to sin and turn against God. And so when he did that, he destroyed Job's livestock. He destroyed his children and Job was in great mourning. But then the devil came back after Job when Job was going through a hard time, when Job was very sad about his family being taken, that is his children being killed. And in Job chapter two, verses seven and eight, it says, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. So Job is in great grief at this point. The devil comes to him and strikes him with boils. And so these were so painful and sore on Job that he took a broken piece of pottery and tried to scrape them off of himself because it was so awful. Well, you know, the devil will come after us when we are down. He will kick us, if you will, while we are down. Maybe while we are in sin, the devil's going to tell us that lie. There's no use of trying to get out of the sin. There's no use of trying to live a better life. Just give up and stay in the sin and embrace that sin. Sometimes when we're in poor health, the devil will come after us. Maybe he wants us to be angry, angry toward God or bitter, bitter about life and bitter toward other people and jealous of other people who don't have the same health problems as we are experiencing. Maybe when we're facing financial hardship, the devil will come after us to cause us to be materialistic, to cause us to be greedy. Maybe he'll tempt us to steal, to take something from others that is not ours, to cheat in business or to embezzle at work. He'll tempt us maybe to put God second, to put our focus on material things and working toward those and leaving God out of our life instead of focusing on God and serving him and putting him first in our lives. So the devil will come after us when things are not going well to try to take advantage of our weakened state or our weakened position in life. And so what we need to do is take heed, as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So let's be very careful because we are going to face temptation. We will face it when things are going well And we'll face it when things are not going well. In other words, the devil's always looking for an opportunity to destroy us. So we need to prepare to face temptation. In Luke chapter 22, Luke 22, we read about Jesus in the garden here. And in the garden, he's facing a great trial and great stress because he's about to be betrayed put on trial and go to the cross. And when he's out there, he takes his disciples with him. And in Luke 22, verse 40, this is what he says to them. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. These disciples were going to face a trial themselves. They were going to be tempted. We read later about Peter being tempted, about him denying Jesus. But he's telling the disciples here, pray that you do not enter or may not enter into temptation. So that's a lesson for us. How do we deal with temptation? 
How do we confront that? Well, one thing we need to do is we need to pray before we are tempted. We know we're going to be tempted and we need to pray about that temptation. We need to pray that we will avoid temptation if at all possible. We need to be praying that when we're faced with the temptation, that we will deny it and not allow the devil to lure us away from God, to transgress God's will but that will stand strong and faithful and true. So we need to pray when we are thinking about the idea of facing temptation. When we know we are about to go through a trial, as the disciples should have understood, they were about to face a great trial. And in James chapter 1, verse 5, James says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So let's pray to God for wisdom that we may be delivered from and be able to face temptation and to do well just as our Savior did well in overcoming the devil. Let us now see that temptation comes through three avenues. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, we read here where John writes about the way in which men are tempted and tells us, of course, to deny that in our lives, to not allow these things to take us away from God. So he says in 1 John 2, verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Temptation, we see, then comes in three ways in our lives, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, as we go back to Matthew chapter 4, we see that Jesus was tempted in these exact ways, these three ways. So let's break it down a little bit and notice what it says here. First of all, the lust of the flesh in Matthew 4, verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Remember, Jesus, after 40 days of fasting, was hungry. And so the devil comes to him and tempts him with the lust of, of the flesh, a fleshly desire, actual craving, a drive within him, within his body. So Jesus was hungry and he wanted to eat, but the devil's trying to get him to do something that's going to violate God's will here. In 1 Corinthians, or rather 1 Kings 11, we see a different temptation, if you will, of the lusts of the flesh. Jesus was hungry, and in 1 Kings chapter 11, we read about Solomon and how that when he was king, he married many foreign women and had concubines. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1, it says, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Amorites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. So it was so, for it was so when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father, David. So here's the thing we want to note. Solomon had these many different wives and concubines for one reason. You know, there were marriages that ancient kings and those who were in nobility would make for political reasons to have an alliance with another nation so that they might more likely avoid going to war with them. But Solomon had 700 wives plus 300 concubines. Even if you could argue that the 700 wives were all political alliances, 
There is only one reason to have concubines, and that is for sexual relations. So Solomon had an issue with the lust of the flesh. And because of this, because of that craving, that desire, and him giving in to that temptation again and again, it warped his way of thinking and opened him up to the temptation to commit idolatry. And he did commit the idolatry. His wives were the vehicle that Satan used to get Solomon to turn away from God into paganism. And so we see that the lust of the flesh is one of the things that the devil uses, one of the ways the devil uses to get to us, to cause us to violate God's will, that we would fulfill that lust of the flesh, that desire in a way that is unrighteous and that would separate us from God. The other avenue of temptation we see again in Matthew chapter 4 is the lust of the eye. So in Matthew 4, verses 8 and 9, it says this, And again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So remember the first one, turning the stones to bread, that was a physical craving, if you will. In this one, in Matthew 4, verses 8 and 9, he takes him up on a high mountain to show him, that is, he's having him look at all these kingdoms. And he's telling him, if you'll just bow down and worship me, then I'll turn all these things over to you. So that's the idea of the lust of the eye. Now, another example of that, again, going back to the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 11, remember that King David had a problem with the lust of the eye. In 2 Samuel, rather, 2 Samuel chapter 11, where David stays home while his army goes out to war. And it tells us in 2 Kings, or rather 2 Samuel 11, verse 2, it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And so the account goes on to say that he inquired about the woman. He called for the woman to come to his house, and then he went to bed with her, and she ended up getting pregnant. David tried to cover that up, ended up murdering this woman's husband and taking her as his own wife. Now, here's the thing we want to look at. Solomon had a lust of the flesh. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines. There's really no arguing his problem. But then David, he goes up and he sees a woman bathing on her rooftop. So this is a lust of the eye. Here's a temptation, an opportunity for the devil to get to him when he looks at someone. And so he committed sin in that way. And the devil will come after us with with the lust of the eye. And that might be a fleshly thing, kind of like what we're seeing here with David, or it might be a material thing. If you remember the account of Achan in Joshua chapter 7 and how that he saw the gold and the silver that they had taken when they went into Jericho and God had told them not to take any of that. All the gold and silver, all the material goods were to be dedicated to God. But he saw it and he was tempted and he took it. And of course, Achan ended up paying for that with his life. So there's the lust of the flesh. There's the lust of the eye. And then, of course, the pride of life. Going back to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, and where the devil takes Jesus up onto the pinnacle of the temple, and he tempts him to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple. And it says there that if you throw your, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And what the devil's doing with Jesus there is he's trying to get him to challenge God's love and care for him. So it's a matter of pride. It's, this isn't a lust of the flesh. This isn't a lust of the eye. This is a matter of the pride of life. 
and pride in his relationship with the Father in heaven. Of course, Jesus denied that temptation. When you go back to the Old Testament, you remember that King Saul had an issue with pride, that when David slew Goliath, and the women of Israel were praising David, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands, that Saul became envious of David and started a life and down a path of trying to destroy David. So you see this pride that can get into people and cause them to do things that they otherwise would not do, cause them to do things that are unrighteous and impure, to reach out and hurt others, and to violate the will of God. So there's pride. Some people have pride in their looks. Some people have pride in their material possessions. Some people have pride in their position, as King Saul had pride in his position. So we realize that there are these three ways of temptation— the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus faced all three forms of temptation in Matthew chapter 4. We see illustrations of it in the kings of Israel, of Saul, David, and Solomon, how that they each had their own weakness in these areas. And we have to be on guard and realize, you know, the devil is after us, through the lust of the flesh, through the lust of the eye, and through the pride of life. So we have to have our guard up so he doesn't take advantage of us. Now, the last thing we want to look at is the fact that we can resist temptation. We do not have to give in to it. It's not a foreordained thing that we must give in to temptation. Now, will we? Yes, there are times in our life when we're going to do it because we make that decision. But we are not forced to commit sin and we are not helpless against temptation. So think about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 we have an admonition here, and we might even call it an assurance and a promise from God. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, there is a temptation we will face in our life at some point. And there are times when we're going to give in to a temptation, but there are times when we won't give in to it because God has given a way of escape. And he gives a way of escape in every temptation. He gives that to us because he loves us. He cares about us. He does not want us to give in and to sin and to be separated from him. So God gives us the assurance that we can resist temptation, that we can get away from it. There's a great illustration of this that we're going to notice in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking here about Lot and really in the broader context about men who are caught up in sin and teaching error and those who get caught up in those things. But notice what he says here concerning Lot. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 6, beginning, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and deliver righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. You see, Lot living in Sodom was surrounded by wickedness day in and day out. He saw the filthy conduct of the wicked as it's reported here. And it tormented his soul day in and day out. It vexed him day by day. 
but it calls Lot a righteous man. That means he didn't give in to that temptation. He didn't give in to what was going on around him. But the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Lot was tempted by the wickedness of Sodom, but he resisted and was delivered by God out of that temptation. So God knows how to deliver us. And if Lot could be delivered when he lived in such a wicked environment, you and I can be delivered even in our wicked environment, in our nation, in our culture. Now, let's understand when we think about resisting temptation, we can resist it. And we need to resist it just like Jesus did. And that is using the word of God as our defense. Remember again how that when Jesus was tempted, that he answered every temptation with it is written. And then he quoted from the word of God. Let's notice again in Matthew 4 verse 4. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Down in verse 7, when he was tempted to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple, he said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In verse 10, when he's tempted to bow down before Satan and receive the kingdoms of the world, he said, away with you, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. You see, the way to defeat temptation, the way to combat the devil and to keep him out of your life is with the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, steadfast in the faith, standing in the faith that is the truth in the gospel, in the word of God. That is how we resist the devil. The Bible describes the word of God as the sword of the spirit in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And we are to use the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So the word of God is given to us as a defense against the devil, as a sword, as a shield, if you will. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, we want to note this in relation to the idea of using the word of God as a defense, using the word of God to resist the devil as our sword and shield. In Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 4, he says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. See, when we read the word of God, We can understand it like the Apostle Paul understood it, because Paul says, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And that mystery of Christ is talking about that mystery that's revealed in the New Testament, the things concealed in the old and now revealed in the new. He says, you can read it and you can understand it. So we have to read, we have to study the word of God and then use that word as a defense against the temptations of the devil. We can do it. You can do it. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ did it when he answered the temptations of Satan. Now let's look in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And notice that when we resist using the word of God, that we're blessed by God. In James 1, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, we can resist the devil, and when we do, we're blessed by God. We honor God. We maintain our purity. We are free from guilt of having failed and having violated the will of God and having hurt other people. So when we resist, when we endure, as James puts it here, we're blessed in that. 
And let's understand, he says, we'll receive the crown of life. That is, we are faithful to God. We resist the devil through our life. Then we will receive that crown of life in the end. We will be given a home in heaven. So as time goes by and we resist sin more and more, we grow stronger and stronger in the end. After we've gone through that challenge, after we've gone through the trial of life, if you will, there is a reward that awaits us. So indeed, we are blessed. But I want us to think about something else before we close out the lesson. Failure is not final. There will be times, as we talked about, when we're going to give in to temptation for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We do that. And when we do that, Satan wants us to stay in that failure. But God wants us to rise above it. God wants us to conquer it. God wants us to escape out of that sin. And he makes that offer to us. And we have several examples in the Bible of those who escaped the sin, escaped the unrighteousness they were caught up in. We mentioned a while ago, David, how that he committed adultery with another man's wife. He ended up having that man killed. And so David was guilty of murder. You think about that sin he was involved in, but yet... In 2 Samuel chapter 12, when he was confronted with that sin, he freely confessed it, he repented of it, and God put that sin away out of his life. He did not hold that against him. You see, our failure is not final. Imagine being a king of God's people and expected to live up to a standard of righteousness and violating it so terribly. How do you go on with life? How do you face yourself? How do you face your family? How do you face the kingdom and the citizens of the kingdom? Well, David was able to do that because he turned to God. He overcame that failure. We mentioned a while ago about Peter, how that the night on which Jesus was arrested and put on trial, that Peter denied the Lord after Peter boasted, Lord, I will not deny you. I will die for you. And then Peter denied him three times and he went out and he wept bitterly. Well, later we see that Peter was restored. He had repented of his sin and the Lord received him back. In John chapter 21, remember the occasion where Jesus is talking to Peter. Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You see, Peter was received back. His failure on the night of the Lord's arrest was not final. He overcame it. He went on to be one of the greatest men to ever live on this earth. Our failure is not final. When we commit sin against God, God leaves a door open and is actually working for us to return to him. So it's not as though we sin and God closes that door and says, I want nothing to do with you ever again. No, God says, I want you to leave that sin. I want you to escape the pain and the sorrow, the guilt that's associated with that sin and come to me. So we notice this in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, the very reason Jesus came into this world is so that men could escape sin. In Mark 16, verse 15, he says to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. You see, he's sending the apostles out to preach the gospel so men may be saved because men have been tempted and men have sinned and they need a way to escape that sin. They have failed to keep God's will, but that failure is not final if they will obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Lord sent the disciples out, preached the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But if you refuse that gospel message, refuse to believe that Jesus is the Christ, refuse to submit to his command to be baptized, then you're going to remain in sin. But you can escape that sin if you will simply submit to his will. We see in the account of the temptation of Jesus that he faced the same type of thing that you and I face in our life, that the devil is there 
putting allurements before us to get us to violate the will of God. And we need to resist those allurements so that we do not transgress the will of God. When we look at the example of Jesus and him overcoming that temptation, it should inspire us, it should encourage us, and it should set the pattern for us that we too can and should overcome temptation. In this lesson, we want to talk about the Godhead. It's a basic fundamental doctrine in the Word of God, but it's a truth that is disagreed on among men, among various religions of men. Atheists, of course, deny the very existence of God or of the nature of deity. Buddhists have the idea that God exists in all things, that everything is divine. The Mormon religion teaches that human beings can ascend to God or the nature of God under certain circumstances. Of course, the Bible teaches something different than all these things. It teaches that there is deity that exists, but there are only three beings that possess the nature of deity. And this nature is called Godhead or Godhood, if you will. Now, the Bible doctrine of the Godhead is vital to our understanding of the nature of deity, and also it's needed for us to understand the plan of salvation that God has given to us. So we want to take a few moments to study this issue so that we can have a better comprehension of the Godhead or the nature of deity. To begin with, let's just look at this idea about the nature of deity and then the fact that there are three beings that possess this nature. The Bible does not set out to prove that God exists. In Genesis 1 verse 1, you remember it simply says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 3, it says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's not a sequential argument or some type of um, thing that's set out in the Bible to prove that God exists. It simply approaches it as an accepted fact that there is God. In fact, when you get to the book of Romans, it's interesting what the Apostle Paul says here regarding God or the existence of God and how that all men should be able to see that God does exist. In Romans chapter 1, if you will notice verse 20 with me here, where he says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, the evidence for the existence of God is abundant and it's easily seen in the world around us. So when we look at the universe, we look at the sun, the moon, the stars, we look at planet Earth and all the things on planet Earth, we should recognize there is a God. There's no need to set about trying to logically argue and produce uh, some type of reasoning that God exists. It should be abundantly and overwhelmingly clear. You know, in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews 3, there's a statement made there that is accepted by pretty much everyone except when it comes to the idea of God existing. So notice this principle that's laid out here, Hebrews 3 verse 4, for every house is built by someone, and we know that to be true. If we see a home, a dwelling from a simple hut to a castle, we recognize somebody built that. There's an intelligent being that dreamed up of that concept that gathered the materials together, put those materials together, and lives there. So we understand every house is built by someone. The second part of the verse says, but he who built all things is God. Well, if a house was built by a house builder, if you will. The universe was built by a universe builder. 
a universal builder, maybe we might say, but there's a creator behind the creation, just as there's a builder behind a building. So the idea is presented to us in the word of God that God exists. It's evident. It's clear. And we need to accept that. And really, all men are without excuse that God does exist. So we can look in nature and know that God exists, but we cannot know God through nature. That is, we don't know his character, his nature, his uh, desire for us, his plan for us in this life. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We need to diligently seek God. It's not enough just to accept the fact or to affirm that God exists. We need to get to know God, and God has given his revelation so that we can know him. We can know the mind of God, or at least that portion which God wants us to know and to understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11, it says this, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. You can't know what's in my mind unless I reveal it to you. And I can't know what's in your mind unless you reveal it to me. Now, I might reveal it through words. I might reveal it through actions, maybe even through facial expressions. But somehow I need to reveal what's in my mind for you to know that. And it's true, the apostle writes here, that we need to have God's mind revealed to us. Otherwise, we don't know what's in his mind. It's not in our nature to automatically know the mind or the will of God. So he's saying here that the Holy Spirit searched out the mind of God and revealed that mind to us, revealed his will to us, why we exist, what we are to do in this life, how we are to please him, what life is about, how to live a good and righteous life, how to have a pure and clean conscience. God had to reveal all those things to us. We do not inherently know it. Now, paganism says that we can know these things through our own reasoning, our own powers of reason, and through searching out in nature, maybe the stars, you know, as the ancient people did, they thought they could reveal that the stars would reveal what man's purpose or what man's actions should be. But we know that that is not so, but it is in the mind of God that we learned about his will and our reason for existence and how we are to live to please him. So God is known through revelation. We know he exists in the creation. Now, let's understand that there is a plurality of beings in the Godhead. So this God that we know exists through creation, this mind of God we know through revelation, that there are three beings in the Godhead. The word in Genesis 1-1 for God in the original is Elohim, and that's plural in nature. That's why when you get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So when it says that God said, let us, that means there are, there's more than one being in the Godhead. This isn't talking about God and angels or some other type of creature. It's talking about God said, let us, referring to God. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So there's a plurality in the Godhead. Now, some people have a real challenge with this. You know, we read in Romans 1.20 a little bit ago that 
there is a Godhood or Godhead. And people try to figure out, well, how can there be one God, but there be uh, three beings in the Godhead? Well, here's how it is. Think of manhood. You could have Bill, Bob, and Brian. There are three distinct individuals with their own personalities, if you will, but each one of them is human or possesses the nature of humanity. We realize that on the planet Earth today, there are some six and a half, maybe seven billion people who possess the nature of humanity or of manhood. That's manhood or mankind. And all of them are separate individuals, but they all have the same nature. They are not animals. They're not fish. They're not birds. They're not angels, but they are humans. The same type of concept would apply to the Godhead or Godhood. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinct individuals, but having one nature, the same nature. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we have an interesting statement here recorded by Moses where he talks about the fact that there is one Lord, and we want to understand what he's saying in this. Because there are some people who say there's only one being that has the nature of deity, and there is no other being that has that nature. But let's understand. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, the Lord is one. One what? One nature. You see, Moses is writing at a time when they're surrounded by paganism. And paganism had the concept that there's a God of the sky, a God of the sun, a God of the moon, a God of the stars, of the earth, of the trees, of the wind, of the water. So they looked at all these different deities in their pantheon, the pagan way of looking at things, and all these deities had different natures, different characteristics, different powers, power over the sun, power over water, power over rain and wind. So they had this concept of different gods with different powers, different abilities, and different purposes. And these gods would fight and war against each other. The Bible is presenting to us, there's one nature of deity, one nature, and deity has one purpose and is unified completely and wholly and perfectly. And as we go through the Bible, we understand there are three beings that possess that nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we said a moment ago, just as there are many individual beings in manhood or humanity that possess that nature, there are three beings that possess the nature of deity. So, Hopefully that helps to clear up the idea of one nature of God, but three beings possessing that nature. Now let's get to more specifically the three beings of the Godhead or that possess the nature of deity. If you will turn over to John chapter 5, John 5, we Read here where Jesus is having to defend himself. And he says this in John 5, verses 17 and 18. But Jesus answered them and said, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now just a quick side note. When it says that he broke the Sabbath, that was from the Jewish standpoint. Jesus did not break the Sabbath because we know that he kept the law, that he honored God's law. So we want to focus, though, on the idea that he said, my father has been working until now and I have been working. So Jesus on earth is referring to the father in heaven. So there's at least two beings we understand in the Godhead that are being talked about here. And he says, 
or it says rather, that the Jews understood what he meant by this because they took up stones or they rather wanted to kill him because he made himself equal with God. So he's saying the nature that the father has, he possessed that very same nature and the Jews became angry about that and wanted to kill him for it. So you have the father and the son possessing the same nature. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus again dealing with the Jews, he makes this statement to them in John 8, verse 40, or rather 58, where it says, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in verse 59, it says they took up stones to throw at him. Well, why did they want to kill him? Because he made himself equal with God. He declared himself really to be Jehovah God. When he says before Abraham was, I am, that I am there is a reference back to Exodus 3. Moses was at the bush and Moses asked the Lord who was speaking to him, who do I tell the children of Israel has sent me? I am has sent you. That's what you tell them, I am. And what he's saying there is, the eternal self-existent one. Jesus, when he says before Abraham was, I am, is identifying himself with God who spoke to Moses in the burning bush, with Jehovah, the self-existent one. So he's declaring himself to be God, and that's why they wanted to take up stones to kill him. One more reference in John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, I and my father are one. He's not saying they're one being, but we they are of one nature. So the father and the son both being God. Now, what was unique about the son, of course, is the fact that he came to the earth in the flesh. In John 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that was the uniqueness of Jesus of Nazareth. He was God manifest in the flesh. He was the incarnation of God. So we have the father and the son possessing the nature of deity. Now, something, of course, unique about the son as well is his role in the Godhead, and in the plan of salvation. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Immerser declared of Jesus of Nazareth, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Toward the end of the book of John, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, It says this, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are written, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus, his role in the Godhead was the Savior or is the Savior, to be the Savior of mankind. And let's turn our attention to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. We have Peter declare here that the Holy Spirit is God. So let's read this and notice it. In Acts 5, verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And while it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. In verse 3, he said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, he says, you've lied to God. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit possesses the nature of deity. And as we said a while ago, the Holy Spirit is the one who revealed the mind of God. In John 16, verses 13 through 15, we have this, John 16, 13 through 15. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. 
for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So it's interesting, we have all three members of the Godhead mentioned here. It mentions the Father, it mentions the Son, and it mentions the Holy Spirit. And what the Father had given to the Son, the Son was to give to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is the revelator or the revealer of the mind of God. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work together. They work together today in providence, in working in humanity or in the nations of men, in the lives of men, to bring about the redemption of mankind. So we have them working together. Now think of it this way, that the Father conceived the plan of salvation, the Son brought it into reality by coming to this earth and being a sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit finished that process or the plan of salvation in revealing the will and the mind of God. The thing that we need to do is accept the fact that God has revealed his will and that you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together to bring about our salvation. It's a basic Bible doctrine and the one that we need to accept in order to be right in the sight of God. In some ways, we understand the concept of deity is difficult to comprehend because we're human, we're not divine. But God has revealed what we need to know and what we can know about him so we can understand him and have a relationship with him. So let us accept it and let us honor the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by accepting that truth that has been revealed, has been preserved for us today. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, a non-denominational group of Christians devoted to following the New Testament as the sole authority for our beliefs and practices. If you live in the area, we invite you to visit our services and get to know us. We have members who drive 45 minutes to an hour one way to assemble with us. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. In this lesson, we want to study about Noah's salvation. And we do this by beginning in Genesis chapter 6, reading verses 1 to 17 to learn a little bit about the events unfolding when we read about Noah's salvation and we learn about what type of character that Noah had. In Genesis 6 verse 1, beginning then, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when they, the sons of men, came in to the daughters of men, or the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that the every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. 
And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. You know, when we read about Noah here and we read about how he's talked about later in the Bible, he stands out as a great character of faith, as one that we can look to as an example of pleasing God and of honoring God. Noah lived in a wicked world, a world that sounds a lot like the world in which we live. As it said there in verse 11, that the earth was filled with violence. The whole earth was corrupt, that man had corrupted his way upon the earth. And remember before in verse 5, it said the thoughts of the heart of men were only evil continually. It was a wicked and terrible world. And yet Noah, because of his faith and righteousness, he was a man who survived the flood along with his family. And because he survived the flood, and it was his descendants that survived the flood as well. We are all descendants of Noah. We are all of one family. We're of all of one race, if you will. And we would do well to be like Noah, to be people who are pleasing to God in spite of the fact that we live in a wicked world. And let's recognize that there is a judgment coming. Just as God judged the world in Noah's day, God is going to judge us at some point in the future. Exactly what point that is, we do not know, but he is going to bring another judgment on the world. But let's look specifically at Noah's salvation. Let's look at how he was delivered from the judgment of his day. And then we also want to look at how we will be delivered of the judgment that is to come. First of all, again, in Genesis 6 verse 5, let's see that Noah was saved by grace. It says again, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So there we see in verses 5 through 7, God is utterly disgusted with the wickedness that is in the world and how men across the world, throughout the world at this time, had become uh, rebellious toward him and stood condemned before him. But, verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was a man who found grace before God, one who found favor in God's sight, if you will. And the way that Noah found grace, let's understand, is this is not pointing to the fact that God just thought well of Noah, which he did, but it didn't end there. We see that as the judgment is coming, the way that he found grace in the eyes of God is that God had a plan of delivering him. And God made provisions for him to be delivered. So first of all, the plan, let's notice that in Genesis 6, verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And you shall. here's how you should make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits. It's height 30 cubits. He tells him to put a window in it. Tells him to put a door in it. Tells him to have lower, second, and third decks. So we see that God gave Noah a plan. He found grace in the eyes of God. And God said, here's the plan. Here, here's the way 
that you're going to survive this flood. So that's grace that God is extending to him. And then if you go over to Genesis 7, verse 16, when the flood waters are coming upon the earth, in Genesis 6, or rather 7, verse 16, says, so those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord sealed up that ark. So Noah received a plan And we understand that when he was in the ark, that God shut him up inside of that ark. So let's think of what it's being uh, told about or what it's explaining to us here. Noah found grace. How did he find grace? How is it that God acted on Noah's behalf to save him from the judgment? And the way that he did that is he gave Noah a plan of what Noah needed to do, and shut Noah up in that ark. Now, we understand that Noah was saved by faith. Yes, he was saved by grace, but Noah was also saved by faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, notice verse 7 here. It says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah was saved by faith. Romans ten seventeen says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So what does this mean when we read Hebrews eleven seven 7 again? It says, by faith, Noah was warned of the things not seen. And what did he do? He moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Now we go back to Genesis chapter 6. And we read where Noah did exactly what God had told him. God gave him the plan. You need to build an ark. Here's how you need to build it. Here's the dimensions you need to use. You put the window in it. You put the door in it and all of that says, here's the plan, Noah. So there is a plan given by the grace of God. And then Noah, by faith, Hebrews 11 says, prepared an ark. That is, he built it. He executed the plan. Again, in verse 22 of Genesis 6, read this with me. Genesis 6, 22. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. In Genesis chapter 7, Genesis chapter 7, and notice here in verse 5, it says, And Noah did according to all that God the Lord commanded him. He did what God told him to do. So Noah was saved by grace because God gave him a plan, and he was saved by faith. Again, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He heard what God said. And he did it. He acted upon it. So he was saved by grace. He was saved by faith in building that ark. If God had told Noah, Noah, here's what you need to do. You need to go build an ark because I'm going to bring bring flood waters on the earth. You need to make sure that that ark is covered inside and outside with pitch. You need to make sure its length is 300 cubits, its width 50, its height 30. You need to put a window in the ark. You need to put a door in the ark. If God had laid all that out to him and Noah said, you know what? God loves me and I'm saved. I don't think I need to build that ark. Would Noah have survived the flood? You and I know Noah would not have survived the flood. So he was saved by grace God's part, and he was saved by faith, Noah's part, or man's part. Saved by grace, saved by faith. But something else we need to notice, and this is where maybe people get sort of tripped up. Maybe it gets confusing because of false teaching that is in the world around us. They they may not understand how all these things fit together. They think, well, he's saved by grace. He's saved by faith. There is nothing else. But the Bible says there is something else regarding the salvation of Noah. And we find it in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And notice here, verse 20. 1 Peter 3, verse 20. It says, 
who formerly were disobedient when once the divine longsuffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you read this here, and it says that during the days of Noah, where there was all that wickedness, the disobedient that he's talking about in 1 Peter 3.20, the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, that is, God was giving time for things to unfold while the ark was being prepared, while Noah was building that ark, as we read in Hebrews 11, as we saw in Genesis 6 and 7, that Noah did all that God commanded him. He prepared that ark to the saving of his house. And it says that in that ark, eight souls were saved, again, 1 Peter 3.20, saved through water saved through water. Well, how is that? Well, you understand that when God told him that he needed to get into that ark, he needed to build that ark, he needed to get into that ark, God put him in or sealed him up in that ark, that when the flood waters came, that's what pushed the ark up. That, that, that's how Noah and his family got above the judgment that was being executed upon the rest of the earth on the rest of mankind and all that which had the breath of life. So God brought the judgment against them, and it was the water that saved Noah. Now, it's interesting that the water also destroyed everybody else. So if you will, think of it this way. The water was the dividing line. The water saved those who did what God said, preparing the ark, getting in the ark, and it destroyed those who didn't do what God told them to do. So it accomplished the purpose, if you will. The water did. Now, our salvation is very similar to Noah's salvation. Now, we're not told to build an ark. We're not told to gather all these animals into a big boat and to ride out a great flood. But it's very similar. And here's how it's similar. First of all, we're saved by grace. If you'll notice Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, the Bible is very explicit that we are saved by grace. In Titus 3, beginning in verse 4, it says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, we are saved by grace, just as Noah was saved by grace. But just as Noah was given a plan, and he was to follow that in order to be saved by grace, so we are given a plan. And when we follow that, we are saved by grace. Notice Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3. And beginning in verse 6, as Paul is talking about how he was blessed to be able to preach the gospel, it says this in Ephesians 3 verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I want us to key in on a couple of things here. First of all, there in verse 11, he says, according to the eternal purpose. Another way to describe that would be according to God's plan. 
a plan that he intended from before time began, that there would be a plan of salvation for man, a way for man to be redeemed from his sins. And so he's talking about this, that he's going out and he's preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's preaching about that plan. And that plan allows the Gentiles to be fellow heirs with the Jews, that is, of the promises to be blessed of God, to be forgiven of God, to be a part of God's family, a part of God's household. And that's where he's really talking here about the church, that the church being established by Jesus Christ is a declaration when people look at it, when the principalities and powers look at that church, they see God's wisdom that it is in that church, sort of like in the ark, you see God's wisdom of saving Noah and his household and the animals. And in the church, we see God's wisdom as how we are saved by the Lord and how God planned and purposed to redeem man. So God's grace is given and extended to us through the plan that he reveals to us, just as his grace was extended to Noah by the plan that he revealed to Noah. So let's understand that God made the provision for us in sending his only begotten son to die on the cross for us. And remember in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost that Peter is preaching to the Jews who are gathered there, and he declared to them that Jesus was the Lord and Christ in Acts 2.36. And you jump down to verse 47, and it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So God shut them up in the church, if you will, just as Noah and his family were shut up in the ark, so that we are shut up in the church, if you will. That God made a plan for that. And if Noah didn't follow that plan in building the ark, if you will, he didn't follow that plan that God told him to, to do, and he didn't get in the ark, it would have been for nothing. And if we don't follow the plan, it'll be for nothing. That is, we won't receive the grace of God. So just as Noah was saved by grace through faith, we are saved by grace through faith. Grace is God's part. Faith is our part, as Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And it says this here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're saved by faith. Again, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Noah heard the word of God. He had faith. He acted on it. He prepared an art. We have the word of God. When we read the word of God, we hear it, we do it. That is an example of faith. That is bringing our faith into reality. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him to all who obey him. We read that Noah had faith. How do we know he had faith? Because it said in Genesis 6, 22 and Genesis 7, 5, that Noah did according to all that God commanded him. In other words, Noah obeyed God. We need to obey God because Hebrews 5, verse 9 says, he becomes the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That's faith. Noah was saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Noah's faith, Noah building that ark, Noah obeying the commandment of God did not nullify the grace of God. Us obeying the commands of God, the plan that God has laid out, does not nullify the grace of God. It activates it. It accesses it. So we are saved by grace through through faith, as James says in James 1.22, we need to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We have to obey. We have to have faith. But then also we go back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and notice the connection that Peter makes between Noah's salvation and our salvation 
with regard to water. Again, let's reread this, verses 20 and 21, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And don't miss the point that Peter's making here. He says, 1 Peter 3, verse 20, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine longsuffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he says, look at Noah and how that there were eight souls saved through water. There's an antitype or a reflection or something similar to what happened back in Noah's day. And he says that which now saves us is baptism. And he's not talking about you get down, you get clean, you wash yourself, you get all the germs, the dirt, the grime off. He's saying it's the answer of a good conscience or some translations have the appeal of a good conscience toward God. But in baptism is where we're saved. Now, there's people who react to that and go, well, the water doesn't save us. And we understand the water in and of itself doesn't save us, that just because somebody gets into the water and is baptized doesn't mean that they're going to be saved from their sins. That doesn't mean that at all. Let's put it this way. So Noah was saved by grace. Noah was saved by faith. That faith led him to build an ark in 1 Peter 3.20 says that the water then saved him. It's God's grace, his plan, that was put into action in a man's life that led to his salvation through water. Same thing today. God's plan is revealed to us. We put that into action in our life. And when we submit to it, when we obey it, we are saved through water. Okay. If somebody doesn't believe in Jesus Christ and they get into the water and they're immersed in that water and brought out, they're not saved. We understand that. They don't really believe it. They're not saved. We understand that. So let's understand that this is the idea of submission to God's plan, adhering to God's plan. That's what this is all about. That's how we are saved like Noah was saved. It's a plan that is given by God and when executed leads to our deliverance from the judgment that is to come. Now we have to live faithfully, we understand, but it is baptism where we go from being a sinner to being a saint. Let's look at Acts 22 verse 16. Acts 22 verse 16, this is the account of Saul of Tarsus being taught by Ananias, a preacher, what he needed to do to be saved. In Acts twenty two sixteen says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Or as Peter put it, the appeal of a good conscience or the answer of a good conscience. That's calling on the name of the Lord. So we realized that we're saved through water, if you will, but it involves God's grace and it involves our faith, without which no man can be saved. So our salvation is similar to Noah's. Noah stands out as somebody that we can look to as a faithful servant of God, who because of his faith in God, he found grace in his sight, he followed the plan that God gave him, and he was delivered from the judgment. You and I need to have that same type of character, that we see God's grace revealed in his plan, that we put that into action into our lives, and we then will be delivered from the judgment that is to come. In this lesson, we want to encourage you to purpose in your heart. That is to purpose in your heart to determine that you are going to live a pure and righteous life so that you can please God.
And to study this issue, we want to look at Daniel chapter 1 and notice the example of Daniel and how that he was a man of God determined to live righteously and purely and how he had a great impact on others when he did this. In Daniel chapter 1, let's begin by reading verses 3 through 8. Daniel 1 verses 3 through 8. Then the king instructed, instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies, of the wine of which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Let's notice, first of all, the idea that Daniel had a position that was very beneficial here in the kingdom of Babylon. Remember, Daniel and his friends were captives. That is, Babylon went over and defeated Judah and took people away into captivity. And Daniel and his three friends are among those first captives that were taken away. And to be a captive in another land, a slave in another land, can very often be a terrible or hard life, difficult life, not many rights, not many privileges there. But here we see that Daniel, for a captive, for a slave, if you will, had a very good position. He was very well off in being chosen or selected for this training program to go and to serve before the king. So this was very important work. It was influential work because Daniel would have influence with the king, but also with other people in the kingdom just because of his positions in spite of the fact that he was a captive here. It's a position that would be desired, that people would want to be a part of if, you know, they had a choice, you know, a choice to go and work on a farm versus to go and to work in the palace to do hard, difficult labor versus, versus doing other types of labor, maybe administrative labor. Well, most people are going to pick in the palace versus out on the farm. And so, we see it was something that was desired. There would be with this position internal pressure to compromise. You know, there's pressure to compromise when you have these trappings, if you will, a privileged position, a good position, maybe position that comes with power, with influence. Maybe it comes with certain perks. Uh, for us, it might be a job or a promotion that we're looking to get or that we do have. So that we, we, we might be tempted to compromise in that. Maybe it is for a young person, captain of a sports team or editor of a school paper or something like that, that that position may come with pressures to do things that are not right. And so we see that Daniel is in that kind of position to where he's being pressured to compromise himself. But we see that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself in Daniel 1 verse 8. He made a decision that he was not going to turn against God. And so we need to draw that inspiration from him to be committed to God, to have an influence with others as Daniel had an influence with his friends, to be an example to the people who are around us. We want to understand that Daniel had a lifelong commitment to this and was very diligent, and we need to do the same. Let's read a little bit further here and notice the fact 
that Daniel was very diligent to do the right thing. In Daniel 1 verse 9 then, now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink for why should he see your faces looking worse than those young men who were your age, who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So Daniel was determined. He purposed in his heart he was not going to eat the king's delicacies. He was not going to drink the wine. And so he requested a special diet. Now, the chief of the eunuchs is concerned about that. Well, if I do that, if I give you a special diet and you're not as strong, you're not as active, you're not as energetic, you're not as able in a physical way to serve as the others are, then I'm going to be in trouble with my king. So Daniel says, okay, I understand you're nervous about that. And let's just do it as a test. Let's do it for 10 days and then see how it turns out. And so the master of the eunuchs agreed to do that. And it says in verse 15, at the end of 10 days, their features and appearance or their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And so he took away those king's delicacies and the wine and put everybody on the same diet as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So it was a success. Daniel took a stand and he stood firm, and that paid off for him and for those who were with him. Now, let's think about this, that Daniel had to push hard to do what was right. He had to take a, take a stand for something on which he was convicted. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians 16, in verse 13, it says, Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. Stand fast, be brave, be strong. That's what Daniel did. See, he was being pressured to eat the diet that the king assigned. He was being pressured to eat pagan ways. So he would have violated his covenant relationship to God in doing this. And so he took a stand and said, I'm not going to do that. Give me this other diet. And the master of the eunuchs protested and said, if I do that, then I'm going to be in trouble. So he pushed back. Well, Daniel didn't take that. He pushed back a little more. Well, then let's do this as a test. Let's give it 10 days. See how that turns out. You know, it can be difficult to change what's accepted as normal. It can be difficult to say, I know you do it this way, or I know it's been done this way but it needs to be done differently because people resist change. They resist doing something different, especially if you are new to the situation and saying, we need to do something different now. Now, in this case, let's understand with Daniel and what we're thinking about in applying it to ourselves is this is a matter of righteousness. This is a matter of truth versus error, of good versus evil, of right versus wrong. So Daniel took a stand and said, I need to do it a different way. And he wasn't going to accept any other answer. And it can be intimidating in situations like this to challenge somebody who is our superior. You know, maybe it's a boss, maybe it's a manager, maybe it's the owner of a business. For young people in school, it may be a teacher or a principal. And you saying, well, I'm not gonna do that because it's wrong. And here's what I am willing to do. Instead of giving me this assignment, let's change it. Give me a different assignment. Instead of asking me to read something that's filled with filth, let me read something that is acceptable. So we look at Daniel and how that it, he had to push to get what he wanted so that he would be right with God. There are times when we may need to push, if you will, 
not being ungodly, not being disrespectful, not being those who cause issues or riots or destructing, destructive of property, things like that. But people who do take a stand and say, this is the right thing to do. That is acceptable. That is exactly what Daniel did. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians 3, let's understand another lesson that we don't know what might be possible in taking the right stand. In Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Daniel was able to go to the person in charge of training the king's servants and the young men who served before him and change the way they did things. Some people would look at that task and say, well, that's an impossible task. There's no way they're ever going to change. But that wasn't Daniel's attitude because he believed in the almighty God. And as Ephesians chapter three, verse 20 says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. When we see something and we're confronted with doing right versus doing wrong, and the wrong thing or the wrong way has been established for a long time, we may look at that and think there's no hope, there's no way that's ever going to change. I don't have the power and the ability. Well, you know what? You and I may not have the power and ability within ourselves, but God has the power and the ability. And so we need to trust in Him in these situations. You know, maybe it is we need to change the dates of a business trip because those dates or those travel days maybe keep us from worshiping God when God says we need to worship Him. We need to worship Him on the first day of the week. And maybe it is we need to say, hey, I can't do that. Let me leave a day earlier or a day later so that I can worship wherever it is that I'm going or maybe before I go. Maybe it is that young people need to leave a game, a sporting event at halftime because they need to make it to worship services or to a Bible study. And they need to say, here's the priority in my life. It's not the sports. It's not necessarily the schooling. And we need to make a, a priority judgment in our lives. What is it that's really important to us? Is it going to a recreational event and watching a sporting team play? Or is it serving God, worshiping God, studying His Word, honoring Him, gathering with others to encourage and strengthen them in doing what is right? Maybe it is we need to request a different shift at work or a different location because of the evil influences around us. You know, sometimes in the workplace, we can be surrounded by very wicked people and it affects us. It influences us. And maybe we need to ask for a change so that we can get away from that. So we can take a stand when we think the situation is impossible but God, in his working, turns it to be something that is possible. And, you know, we need to be willing to accept the consequences, just as Daniel was. If you'll go to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, we'll look there in just a second. You know, Daniel, when he went to that chief of the eunuchs, he told him, you know, give us a different diet. And at the end of 10 days, you examine us compared to the other young men. And whatever your decision is, do that. It's acceptable. So he was willing to accept the consequences of taking a stand. You and I need to be willing to accept those consequences. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So whatever that consequence may be, you know, for young people in school, it may be a bad grade because they refuse to endorse evolution or homosexuality or any number of things that the school systems these days are pushing on the young people. And they take a stand. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to endorse that. They may get a bad grade. They may be punished in some way. Well, you know what? They need to be willing to accept that. And the parents need to be willing to accept that as well. It's just a consequence of doing what is right. Maybe it is a loss of a job. You know, there have been plenty of people who have refused to compromise. 
Maybe they refused to lie. Maybe they refused to look the other way when somebody was doing what was wrong. And they've accepted the fact that they would lose their job over that very issue. And that's the right thing to do. And we need to be willing to accept those consequences. Maybe it's loss of pay, loss of income over these things. But we need to be willing to do it, to accept that. Because we love the Lord more than we love the things of this world, more than we love the approval of men. We want the approval of God. You know, if your actions lead to great faith and service to God, then any sacrifice and any consequence is worth it. Because in the end, we're going to receive that crown of life. So let's be determined that we won't defile ourselves just as Daniel was determined that he would not defile himself, that we will be pure and free as he was. So one of the things we need to be pure about is our entertainment. So much of the entertainment on television or the radio, uh, on the internet, is immoral. It's impure. It's unrighteous. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 20, Jesus says this, What comes out of man that defiles a man, for we're from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. You know, be determined in your heart, purpose in your heart, that you're not going to defile yourself with immoral entertainment, with the filthy language, the impure images, the actions of people. You don't want that in your heart. You don't want that in the heart of your family. You want to do what is right. So be determined. No matter the consequence, no matter how people may make fun of you, no matter how people may even get upset with you, be determined. You're not going to defile yourself with filthy entertainment. And be determined that you will not defile yourself with materialism. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy 6, and beginning in verse 6, the Apostle Paul writes this, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, we need to resist that temptation to materialism. And it defiles people. It causes them to compromise on what they know is right. And when they do that, they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. They've abandoned the faith and they've condemned themselves before God. They've made a wreck of their lives. And we can see this in the world all around us. There are many people who go after material things but are miserable. And their homes are broken homes because they've put material things above their relationship to God first and their relationship to their family second. It's a shame and it's sad to see this going on in our society. And be determined to not defile yourself with ungodly speech. In James chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And the thing, the tongue, is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by hell. You know, the tongue is very powerful. There are times when we use it to hurt others, to cut them to the core. There are times when we use it to convey unrighteous thoughts and feelings, to evoke lust and unrighteousness in others, to stir up anger and hatred, bitterness and resentment. And the Word of God says here, don't do that. Don't allow that to happen. Be careful about your tongue. You and I need to determine that we will not defile ourselves with our tongue. We need to purpose in our heart, just as Daniel purposed in his heart that we will not allow our tongue to be used for ungodly purposes, but for the praise and honor of glory of God and for the benefit and the blessing 
of our fellow man. Let's determine not to defile ourselves. Let's determine to live purely and righteously just as Daniel did and to help others who are around us to live purely and righteously. So we encourage you as you reflect on your life, as you recognize that there are situations, there are circumstances where you're pressured to do what is wrong, determine now, right now, purpose in your heart today that you will not defile yourself, but that you will honor your Father, your Creator, who is in heaven. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His plan for saving man, or the church that Jesus established? Then please let us know and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin or to receive a copy of the outlines of our lessons on this program. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that phone number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. Visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. And we have classes for all ages, so bring the whole family. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information, once more, is the phone, 828-465-3009. You can email us at contact at wordandsword.com or go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword or go to our website word and sword.com that's word a n d sword.com and our address once again is 656 st james church road newton north carolina again we thank you for watching and please feel free to reach out with your bible questions i ever And thou